Now quit talking out there. <laughs> Good morning to everybody and welcome to our service of worship. We have some announcements as per usual. First of all, thank you to everybody who's been asking about us. Um, let me just see if I can get this said one time and then you don't have to ask me later. We're about 90% back. You can hear it in my voice. We were COVID positive. We, uh, we came out of that about five days ago now. But uh, it's, it really, I never felt horribly sick, but I'm not completely well yet either. We know that we're not contagious at this point. So um, I'm not wearing a mask for that reason, but I'm also thinking I'm not going to shake hands after worship today. But please come talk to me if you want to. Please do sign the attendance pads and uh, put them in the offering plate when the time comes. And if you want to make some comments on our stream with the Facebook, go for that. <clears throat> the giving tree will be erected today after worship on the sidewalk in front of the church. If you can stay for a few minutes and help with that, um, it's not that hard to do, but the more hand, many hands make light work, and it would be great if you could do that. The angel tree is downstairs, and that's a, a separate item. That's for the DCS, and we're, you take an ornament off of it, and you sign up for that ornament, and then you look and see what it says, and then you bring that in and lay it at the foot of the tree in another week. Uh, we're going to be having an adult Sunday school class. Uh, I think that's starting next Sunday. Is that correct, Andrew? Do you know? Yes? All right, I should have looked at our Christian educator. Sorry, so it's going to be in the lounge, and it's about liberation theology, which is an interesting and complicated topic, but it would be interesting to compare and contrast with our own beliefs and your own personal beliefs, and, and uh, we'll see where that goes. On the 9th of December, 7 p.m., the Farrington Grove Chorale will be, present the service of Lessons and Carols over at St. Stephen's, so that's a week from Friday. And Mana from Seven is still collecting empty egg crates, egg cartons, and uh, plastic bags to help them in their distribution of food to the needy. For our prayer concerns today, we have a correction. Steve Mead is in need of prayer. He is facing surgery for cancer, but the correct type of cancer is prostate cancer, and that's not what we put in our, our materials. So I'm sorry about that if uh, I played a role in making that happen, although Honestly, the last two weeks are in a fog for me anyway, so I don't know. Um, but Steve, let's, let's keep you in our prayers. Uh, Norma Shaw is, as yet, as far as I know, I spoke with her about 24 hours ago, an undiagnosed malady of some kind that has had her hospitalized for over a week now. And they've run Boku tests, and they don't have a theory yet that they've really settled on. So she is frustrated. She's, as she says of herself, I'm a goer and doer, not a sitter. And she's getting tired of that and, and of feeling poorly. And let's pray for her and for Lowell as well. Uh, Winnie McCammon's friend has uh, had a recurrence of breast cancer. And Winnie is asking us to renew our prayers for her friend. And PJ Ekstrom um, had a lumpectomy done on Friday, no, Wednesday of last week. And uh, it was very successful. And she did authorize me to say this and ask for our prayers for her healing. But she also said, but I don't want to be the center of attention all the time. So it, we'll have to weigh that out carefully about how we approach her. But I'm sure cards and, and calls are more than welcome. So those are our prayer concerns and our announcements. Let us now turn to worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yeah. 
Please join me in the call to worship. In these days of clouds stifling sunlight, the world burdened by gray gloom, open our eyes, Lord, to the coming of your light that lifts darkness from the world. Chill seeps deep into our bones, hearts grow rigid like frost, souls wrap up against the lonely cold. Open our souls, Lord, to the warmth of your coming. Melt the hardness that keeps us from loving you and one another. Come, let us worship the giver of light and warmth. Come, let us worship our God. We light this candle as a symbol of expectation. May the light of God shine in the darkness to show us the way of Christ. We await the day promised by the prophet Isaiah, who proclaimed, The Lord will decide for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords upon into their plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Hark the herald angels sing, Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace.
God calls us to confession. In this Advent season, we prepare to celebrate the birth of the Christ child. But he came to live among us because we sin and cannot save ourselves. We rely completely on his grace. He justifies, sets us right with God through his own righteousness. Let us confess our sins that we might receive forgiveness. O oh Lord our God, we come before you to admit our wrongdoings. We have done that which we should not have done, and we have failed to do that which you call us to do. We walk weakly with you. We act out of fear and selfishness. We allow ourselves to descend into darkness. Show us your light yet again, we pray that we might walk more nearly in your footsteps. Forgive us, we ask, that we might be freed from bondage. In your Son's holy name, amen. Jesus wore purple, the color of royalty, when the soldiers mocked and crucified him. Yet he really was the king. He proved his power by rising from the grave. He paid the price we owe for our sins. Praise God that in Christ we have forgiveness. Praise God that in Christ we have new life. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and also with you. Peace be with you. Good morning. Thanks, you too. Good morning. Hi, everybody. How are you? Good. You did a good job up there. Good reading. Oh, my goodness. Look how pretty our sanctuary looks. Wow, beautiful. Do you guys know why it looks like this? Because everybody helped. That's a good answer, Annie. But why, why do we decorate like this? What are we getting ready for? Christmas, right? Christmas is coming. We're in the season of Advent. It's a special time of year in the church. It's a special time of year with lots of extra fun things going on, sometimes at school and at home and other places. We think about this as being the season of joy sometimes, right? Is that a good way to describe it maybe? Yeah? Yeah. Can you think of anything that brings you joy? Or what your face might look like when you feel joyful? Hmm, does it look like this? 
No? What does it look like? Yeah? Maybe a smile? Yeah? Feeling happy inside? Yeah, right? Sometimes this time of year we also get, get gifts, don't we? Yeah? It's a season of, of getting gifts and also of giving gifts, right? And the Bible reminds us of that. It talks about being a cheerful giver. Those are kind of like synonyms, huh? Cheerful, joy, happy, right? All those words kind of mean the same thing. So it makes us feel happy, it makes us feel joyful, maybe if somebody gives us a gift, right? Something we really like, something they, they bought especially for us or thought that we would really enjoy. Yep. It can also feel that good to be the giver of the gift, right? What if you took the time to think about something that somebody you love might really, really like? Like your mom or dad or somebody that's special to you. And then when you gave it to them, how would you want them to feel? Happy, right? Joyful, yes. There's lots of chances to give, not just to those people in our families, but here through our church family, we're setting up our giving tree, we hope. We'll see if the weather cooperates for us. Setting up our giving tree after church today, we have our angel tree downstairs, all chances to give to those who need it the most and that we can feel joyful about. You can do that any time during the year, but maybe in this Advent season at this Christmas time, we, we do that and we think about that a little bit more and we keep that close in our hearts. So anytime you have a chance to give, even if it's just a kind word or a hug or a little thoughtful moment or gift to somebody, remember that, that Jesus wants us to do that anytime we can. Can you do that for me? Yeah? Let's say a quick prayer together. Dear God, we ask you to help us to be joyful when we give to others. We ask that you help us remember that our giving does bring joy, not only to us, but to the people that we are giving to. We thank you for everything you have given us and for the abundance that we have to be able to be cheerful givers. Help us remember that throughout this season of Advent and throughout the entire year ahead. In your name we pray. Amen. Oh Lord, our God, we ask that you might <clears throat> bless the reading of your word, that we might come to a better understanding of your truth and will. <clears throat> we ask also that you might grow our spirits by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we in turn might bless your creation. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Today's scripture reading is from Isaiah Verse two, Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amar, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. 
Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. New Testament lesson today comes from the letter to the Romans. We're in chapter 13, beginning in verse 11. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Rome. Listen now for the word of God. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake up from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We had to put our beloved pit bull Kila to sleep last August. And that meant that for the first time in 32 years, our household was down to just one 
pet, our other pit bull, Brianna. Now, a few weeks after that happened, I was doing some online banking at home, and Linda got back, came back to the house from her morning workout. And she didn't come in the way she normally does. She kind of kind of snuck in. And she looked around the corner at where I was, and she had this sick little smile on her face. <laughs> and she said, you're going to kill me. And I said, did you get another dog? <laughs> and she said, no, a cat. <laughs> She found him meowing in some shrubbery outside of Building 5 at the Union Hospital complex. And she gestured for me to follow her back out to the car and meet him. As she did, she explained to me that she had looked around. There was nobody that she could detect looking for the cat. It was a good long distance from any housing, and cats don't usually walk that far away from their houses. There were no signs up on telephone poles or trees saying, missing cat, picture of this cat, nothing like that. It looked like it had been dumped there. So Linda picked it up. It went right up to her and she picked it up and we haven't let go yet. Now our son told us later that day, you know, dad, and whenever he starts like that, it's like, okay, you know, you know, you want your kids to grow up and to be independent and, and thoughtful and all of that, but then they start getting independent and thoughtful on you, and it gets really annoying. <laughs> but anyway, he said, um, you really need to go on Facebook and see if anybody's looking for the cat. And it turns out that there are at least five lost and found pets in Terre Haute Facebook pages. So for three days, we went through all of those. They all seem to show the same pictures of all the same animals, but not that cat. And so at that point, we decided he's ours. So we kept him, and we named him Isaiah. <laughs> now, I think that you think you know why I chose the name Isaiah. I mean, I'm a man of the cloth, right? But you would be wrong. I named him after the legendary IU basketball player, Isaiah Thomas. <laughs> And that is the truth. I even spell it the incorrect way that Isaiah Thomas's mother gave him his first name, I-S-I-A-H. So it's, uh, you know, anyway, he's, he's an orange tabby, he's a handsome lad, and he's a good cat, and he and the pit bull are figuring it out. So it's all good. Linda and I were seniors and members of the IU pep band for basketball games in 1981, the year Isaiah Thomas led us to a national championship. This means that we got all expenses paid trips to every tournament game that IU played in. We were put up in the nicest hotels, we were given per diem for meals, and we got to play in the stands. We met Bryant Gumbel on the sideline of the before the national uh, semifinal game, and I got Dick Engel's autograph, and he told me secretly, Keep it on the down low till after the broadcast, but I'm really pulling for IU. <laughs> now, I thought, right, you say that to everybody, right? Whatever school they're from. No, turns out he had a degree from IU. He had gone to broadcast journalism school there and gotten his bachelor's degree at IU, his other degrees at Michigan. So he really went down in the world after that. <laughs> um, now, we got to spend two extra nights in Philadelphia. I know the, the old uh, joke is first uh, second prize is a week in Philadelphia. First prize is two weeks in Philadelphia. But um, it was great. We were on Broad Street. We were in a Hilton hotel. And we got two extra nights because that was the year that John Hinckley Jr. shot President Reagan. So they postponed the final game for two more nights. And we got to enjoy all of it. For us, it wasn't such a great thing for President Reagan. But for us, it was a fine and wonderful time. It felt like to me the least I could do was name my cat Isaiah. <laughs> now the prophet Isaiah, he was a very different breed of cat. <coughs> See what I did there? He proclaimed his messages from 742 to 687 BCE. During these years, the northern kingdom of Israel got annexed into the Assyrian Empire to the north. 
The southern kingdom of Judah, in which Isaiah lived, lived under the shadow of not just the Assyrians, but the Babylonians to the east. Isaiah heard the Lord telling him to tell the people that God was controlling all of these geopolitical events. That God was using these foreigners to punish the people of God for their failure to obey the law of God. In the first two-thirds of the book of Isaiah, which is the only part of the book that could conceivably have come from the prophet's own hand, he paints an apocalyptic vision. The end is near. God is going to bring down judgment on the people. It's going to happen any minute now. And it's going to be your fault. Because you did not heed my word. They have it coming. They've earned it. But sprinkled throughout these dire warnings are these lovely moments of joy and light, optimism. Most of these predict an age of peace to follow the day of judgment. They usually reference the coming Messiah as well. Our passage for today doesn't happen to mention the Messiah, but it sure does talk about that age of peace which is to come. It begins with the words, in the latter days. In the days after the judgment. In the latter days, the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of all the mountains. This is a reference to Mount Zion, on which the temple sat in Jerusalem. The mountain of the Lord will be the highest of all the mountains, and all the peoples and all the nations will stream there. That's a great verb. Stream there like water flowing over a waterfall. That he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths that we might be obedient. That's a big theme for Isaiah. Obey the law, that we might learn his ways and walk in his paths. Here he dreams of all the nations of the earth becoming faithful to the God of Israel. And the ultimate outcome outcome of this coming together will be peace. Weapons of war will be beaten into farming tools. And he concludes that nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Would that this prophecy had come true by now. No more war. According to a report from the Reuters News Service, Andrei I. Z., I don't even know what his last name was, was born in the western Ukrainian city of Lvov. An engineering student, He joined a field trip from college to inspect bridges in Russia. During the trip, he got arrested for the possession of marijuana, which we've learned recently is a very serious deal in Russia. And he spent the next three years in prison in the Russian city of Volgograd. Three months ago, he and every other person residing in that prison were placed in trucks and taken to an army base nearby. There they were told that they were going to become soldiers in the Russian army, and they were given two weeks of training and a weapon. Then they boarded a train, and they were taken back into the eastern part of Ukraine near the city of Kharkiv. Andrei took his time. He picked his spot. But the first chance he got, he deserted. He laid down his weapon and walked across the lines, holding up his hands and shouting in Ukrainian until he was able to convince the guys on the other side that he was one of them. His captors asked him to stay and join the Ukrainian army. He promised that he would do that, but first he wanted to travel cross-country back to Lvov to check in on his mother and father. So he agreed to that, and an 18-hour train ride later, he found himself back in Lvov. His parents were still living in the same apartment. He had no trouble finding them all was well. Two days later, after their reunion, their apartment was hit by one of those random missiles the Russians are firing off. Yuri and his parents were among the 17 people killed by that blast.
William Tecumseh Sherman was a Union general during the Civil War. His armies marched to the sea from Atlanta to the Atlantic was just left a trail of biblical devastation. In later years, he would write, quote, Yes, I knew what my men were doing. They had to do it. The worse it got for the Confederates, the sooner the enemy would buckle. Sherman also gave this famous quote in a speech, quote, I am sick and tired of war. Its glory is all moonshine. It is only those who have neither fired a shot nor heard the shrieks and groans of the wounded who cry about aloud for blood, for vengeance, for desolation, who want war. No one else does because, and here's the part you already know, war is hell. When will we learn not to wage war? When will the prophecy finally come true? Whether the Assyrians or the Babylonians, the Union or the Confederacy, the Russians or the Ukrainians, wars waged bring hell to all those in their path. We cannot even imagine unless there happens to be somebody listening to me right now who has actually fought in a hot battle, we have no idea. I know I don't. We have adults living with their families here in Terre Haute who came here from those Balkan republics that, that resulted from the dissolution of Yugoslavia. They were born in at least three of those different republics. And this, here's a key fact. The three families that I know about, they have for generations going back in their families, they have been at war with each other's places. But I know one of them rather better than the others that I know. Scott knows who I'm referring to by now. Um, I once talked to him about this, and he said, he shrugged. And he said, yes, we were fighting. But here in America, those things just don't seem so important anymore. When this guy turned 16, I think it was, his parents told him he had to leave. He had to walk away, or else he would get drafted into the army of one of those little republics. And they were fighting a nasty, hot little war in the 90s in that part of the world. Our Afghan families here got away from war. The Taliban were coming. Actually, they got there before our Afghan friends got away. It was only through the protection of the American military that they got on those airplanes and flew here, eventually. The more things change, the more they stay the same. This truism can give us a sense of fatalism. If war is so endemic, and if war is so huge, what can we do about it? What sort of impact can we possibly have? Well. We can vote for politicians who refuse to support it. Although, I'll tell you what, as I look at the American contemporary political landscape, I don't see a party that's truly working to make peace. We can pray for peace. We can join organizations that work to make peace. And we can try to clean up our own houses. We can do what we must do in order to maintain peace in our own hearts. I maintain, we had another spate of mass shootings this week. And I maintain that our focus on this is off-center. I think that these are the result of a sickness in the soul of our society. The guns are the tools. They're incredibly efficient tools of, of destruction and killing. And I'm certainly uh, open to discussion about ways to limit their access to them. But what makes a person able to just randomly pick off a bunch of other people? It's a lack of peace in their hearts and minds. That's what it is. And until we take that seriously, nothing is going to change. And every time I walk into a Walmart, I'm going to be looking for an exit strategy. I'm not kidding.
I know that just working on our own peace can be a frustrating prescription for this big problem. And justifiably so. We want to do something meaningful and big and change it all. And we should keep trying. I freely admit this is not everything I would want to say. But it appears more practical to me. And coming out of our passages from the Bible today, it appears to be to me to be the message that I'm called to preach. Work for peace in your own heart. Work for peace in your neighbor's hearts. Work for peace in your community's heart. War is not only endemic, but there's a whole machine that's predicated on making it. Speaking in 1959, Dwight Eisenhower called that machine the military-industrial complex. It's this unholy alliance of the executive branch and the Congress of the United States government, federal government, with corporations that profit by making weaponry and material for war. Eisenhower, the five-star general, warning about this. All we can do is work on our own hearts and to make peace in that way and try to find a way somehow to affect this discussion in our country so that we take the scales from our eyes and quit putting up with funding and allowing this machine to grind on. In his letter to the Romans, the Apostle Paul addressed a Christian community over which he had even less control than we have over the military-industrial complex. He probably wrote from the Greek city of Corinth, which was at best a week away from Rome if the winds blessedly blew his ship in the right direction. More importantly, he wrote to people living in the capital city. Now, the Christians in Rome likely did not have real power themselves, but they saw real power exercised every day of their lives. It was the imperial capital of one of the most powerful empires in history. Furthermore, they knew that Paul, a Jew, had no worldly power whatsoever. He wrote to people who had no earthly reason to listen to him. Smartly, he altered his approach to them accordingly. He addressed them more deferentially than he did the, the uh, recipients of his other letters. He understood that they needed a reason to pay attention to him. So he gave them one. You know what hour it is, he said, for salvation is nearer to you now than when we first believed. In other words, Paul honestly believed that that day of judgment that Isaiah had prophesied would come at any minute. Get your house in order before the day happens, because then it will be too late. Now, the end has still not come. We're about 1900 years, 1950 years after Paul wrote those words, and the end has still not come. And there's this tension between predictions of the end of time and the actual coming of the end of time, and preachers have exploited that tension forever. Get upset, get worried. It's what most advertising and most news programs are based on nowadays as well. Be upset, be afraid, and then do what we tell you. In this case, what does Paul want us to do because the end is near? He wants us to get our own houses in order. He wants us to try to become more purely followers of Jesus Christ. Take off the old nature, he says. Put on Christ and lay aside these works of lecherous you know, uh, all the, the negative things he says. But if we could put that into a positive spin, it would be along the lines of seek to produce peace. Love. Patience. Forbearance. Cleanse your own heart and soul. And work to, to support that work for others as well. Be sober. Modest. Giving. Use the resources of the Holy Spirit to seek the greatest degree of Christ-likeness, if that's a word, that you possibly can. 
Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And he spoke clearly and often about his desire that his followers make peace. Peace militarily and peace personally. Use your motivation, whether it's concern about the coming apocalypse, or fear, or joy, or hope, to make peace first in your own heart. Ask God. Pray for it. Receive it when it comes. Today, we begin Advent, the season of the expectation for the second coming of our Lord, the coming of the Prince of Peace. We can find no better way to prepare for his return than working to make peace. Let us pray. Lord, we are imperfect vessels, and our hearts do turn to anger and fear. Work upon us, we pray. Clean out the the doubt, the guilt, the fear, and fill us up again with your spirit that we might indeed find the way and the power to make peace, small and large. In Jesus' name, amen. Please refer to your bulletin and join with me in our unison affirmation from the brief statement of faith produced in this century by the Presbyterian Church USA. The same spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith in life in Christ through scripture, engages us through the word proclaimed, claims us in the waters of baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls women and men all to the seats of the church. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without
not ceasing to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of peoples long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. Thank you. Please be seated. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, there is so much strife and anger and violence in this world. We pray therefore, O oh Lord our God, for those with whom you have entrusted authority, that they might have the quality and the desire to make peace, not war. We pray for those who find themselves in the path of destruction. Protect them, we ask. We pray for those who mourn the loss of loved ones, no matter which side or sides they may be on. And we ask that it might be your will that the mourning might cease and the war with it. Lord, sometimes it feels to us as though there is a war going on here as well. We pray for those troubled souls and corrupted souls, for those who are bent out of shape so far that they are willing to hurt and kill. Bring them peace in their minds, we pray, and in their hearts, that they might be turned away from committing such acts. We pray, Lord, for the victims as well and their families, and make the same prayer that we do for those who are victimized by battle. Lord Jesus, we pray for the sick in mind, body, and spirit for little children with dangerous viruses, for elderly folk, the same for all who are, are dealing with whatever it is that's happening. We pray for those members of this church whom we have named, and there are others who have asked not to be named, who are facing various medical dilemmas. And we, as always, we pray for the skill and, and the patient care of those who are charged with, with treating them. And we pray that it might be your will that they might come back to us whole and healthy and happy. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for this city and the people in it. Open our eyes, we pray, day by day, that we might see what is happening around us and where we can step into it and by your power do something meaningful. We thank you for ministries that feed people, house people, get them washing for their clothing. We thank you for the, the, the people who have answered your call in this way. And give them, we pray, constant energy and ability to press on. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this church, for this congregation. And we pray for its leaders, its elders, and its deacons, those who teach through its ministry, and the members of the staff. Help us, we pray, to see your vision, to understand what you are calling us to do and to be, and that we might lead in that direction, not our own. Lord Jesus, we make all these prayers confident that you are hearing them because you told us to pray. And in fact, you taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let the ushers come get the offering.
us pray. O oh Lord our God, we thank you for the greatest gift of all time, which was your gift to us of a son, a savior. And in reply, we, uh, we take this opportunity with gladness to give back to you just a portion of what you have given us. Take these offerings, we ask, and use them to furthering the works of your will, near and far, now and forevermore, in the name of Christ. Amen. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen.